uh, chapter five is about open systems. So up until now, we've been working with closed systems. Chapter five, we're working with open systems. Please do the reading as you've probably picked up from now. Um, I don't go over everything in the reading. So supplementing the lectures with reading is a very good use of your time. Um, I've opened the reading assignment along with chapter five homework. Uh, the home chapter five homework, I think it's due. Let me double check when it's due. It's due March 19th. So yeah, this Friday. Um, let me double check right now that you'll have everything. I think after today, you should have everything you really need to be able to solve. Um, hmm. Yeah, you should be able to. After today, I believe I'm going to change one part of one question. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay, then I'm going to go ahead, get started. Let me make a note about something really quick to make sure I need to add an additional hint to the homework um, for one of the problems. So let me make a note to do that. So if you remember from last week, we went over, um, right before the exam, we went over the cases where if you have steady flow, um, your mass coming in, your mass flow rate coming in needs to equal your mass flow rate going out. If you have steady flow and a single stream, which is what we did, with the example problem of a hose, your mass flow rate at point one has to equal your mass flow rate at point two, or your density, average velocity, cross-sectional area at point one has to equal your density, velocity, and cross-sectional area at point two, plugging in equations we know from mass flow rate. If you have a steady flow, so not a dynamic flow, a steady constant rate flow, that's incompressible, oops, incompressible. So a liquid, not a gas. You can have your summation coming in of your volumetric flow rate needs to equal the summation going out of your volumetric flow rate. You should have already written these down last week. I'm just going over them because they're important. So if you have a steady, um, you have a steady flow, incompressible, and then a single stream. You should be able to use inference and figure out what this is, but it's the volumetric flow rate at point one needs to equal your volumetric flow rate at point two, or your average velocity times your cross-sectional area at point one needs to equal your average velocity and cross-sectional area at point two. So um, these are, for importantly, these are equations for open systems. Closed systems, you're not exchanging mass really, right? You have a closed box, you have a rigid container, you have a piston cylinder device. These are for open systems where we're looking at a control volume. So we've defined our system, we've defined the control volume that we're looking at. And these are the different equations for steady flow systems with incompressible or compressible fluids, 
with single streams or um, multiple streams. All right. So you should have had these written down from last Monday, but just reviewing them in case you do not. All right, so we did the example problem um, proving that if you take a hose diameter and you make it smaller, the velocity of water will increase uh, because of this relationship here. So if you take your cross-sectional area and you make it, or your, yeah, your cross-sectional area and you make it smaller, in order for these to be equal, this volume uh, velocity has to increase to compensate. That's why when you make a diameter of a hose smaller with your finger or with a spray nozzle, your velocity increases. You can spray a lot further. Bye, Beefy. Beefy got to check the other room, you know, got to do the rounds. All right. Um, we also discussed the equations for fluid work and for fluid energy, which these equations uh, we've seen before in previous chapters where we have uh, your, oh, I'm sorry, was there a question? Okay, so sometimes uh, for non-flowing fluid, non-flowing fluid or fluid that was flowing really slowly, we would have um, our specific energy of a non-flowing fluid as our internal specific energy plus our kinetic specific energy plus our specific potential energy or our internal energy plus one half velocity squared plus a height term times gravity. Our units being as always kilojoules per kilogram. Golly, that I got out of control there. Kilo joules per kilogram. And then um, sometimes in the chapter, you will see this E written as a theta. So um, you can also see this as not just for non-flowing fluid, but when we include flowing fluid, we have to include flow energy. Once again, I went over this on Monday. I'm just briefly going over it again, since I know you probably were focused on the exam. So we have E or this theta term, which then we have our pressure times our specific volume plus our internal energy, plus our specific kinetic energy, plus our potential energy. So here represents our flow energy, and this represents our fluid energy, which makes sense because this is just energy from the fluid. This is energy from the flowing of the fluid. And then recall that our enthalpy, specific enthalpy is going to be pressure times specific volume plus internal energy. So we can replace this term here with enthalpy. And our specific energy or this theta term becomes enthalpy plus specific kinetic energy plus specific potential energy. The units are still going to be kilojoules per kilogram. All right, so all of this should be familiar from previous chapters or from last Monday. So when I am looking at including these two concepts of mass flow rate of an open system um, needs to be equal at, the, at, the, at point one and point two. Um, those kind of equations I went over first with the steady flow, incompressible, steady flow, single stream. Those equations, when I'm combining them with the energy equations, we can now look at, these are new notes. So energy transport by mass. And this is on roughly page 223 in the 8th edition. I think it's like 221 in the ninth. That's where it starts.
So when we're looking at energy transport by mass, we have energy that's being transported through mass movement. And here we're incorporating the same things that we've been learning before. We're just looking at them in a different perspective. So our energy equation here is going to be this M times specific energy, or you'll see it written in the chapter M times theta because that's they all of a sudden switch nomenclature, which we just know is also M times H plus one half velocity squared plus uh, gravity times a height term Z. <laughs> and the units here are going to be kilojoules because we have now factored our kilojoule per kilogram times kilogram leaves us with kilojoules. We've looked at these types of equations in several chapters now. And if we include the, if include rate of energy transport, so if we include a per time component now, we're going to have the rate of energy transport as a function of mass is going to be equal to our mass flow rate times specific energy or our mass flow rate times this fluid flow energy, which is going to be our mass flow rate times H plus one half velocity squared plus our height term times a gravity. I'm sorry, these units are not going to be kilojoules. They're going to be kilojoules per second or kilowatt or watt. Because now we've included here a time term. So this is our mass flow rate, our mass per time, kilojoules per second. So we have, um, you don't need to write this, but if any of you are confused of why this switches to kilojoules, our mass flow rate term is going to be kilojoules per second. And our fluid energy term is going to be kilojoules per kilogram. So we have our kilograms cancel, our units that are left, we're left with are kilojoules per second, which we know are a kilowatt. All right. I'm going to do example five dash three. And this is where we have a pressure cooker where the volume is four liters. The pressure is 150 kilopascals inside this pressure cooker. Um, a pressure cooker has steam leaving. Pressure cooker has steam leaving the liquid in the pot, in the pressure cooker, has decreased by 0 0.6 liters, by 0 0.6 liters in 40 minutes. So we have some sort of time term. The cross-sectional area of where the steam is leaving, so the cross-sectional area is eight square millimeters, determine A, the mass flow rate of the steam, and the, the exit at the, the velocity at the exit. So a pressure cooker with the volume of four liters, pressure of 150 kilopascal has steam leaving. The liquid in the pot has decreased by 0 0.6 liters in 40 minutes. 
the cross-sectional area of where the steam is leaving is eight millimeters squared. Determine A, the mass flow rate of the steam leaving and the velocity at the exit. B, the total, the total and flow energy of steam per unit mass. The total and flow energy of steam per unit mass. And C, the rate the steam leaves a pressure cooker. The rate the steam leaves. So we have some sort of pot that we're using to cook something like rice or soup. Um, it has some sort of steam vent at the top where steam is leaving. We have some sort of liquid left in the pressure cooker. We know that um, the volume of the pressure cooker is four liters. The pressure inside is 150 kilopascal. We know that this cross-sectional area where the steam is leaving is eight square millimeters. We know that the liquid in here, so um, the liquid has gone down by 0 0.6 liters in 40 minutes. And we want to determine the mass flow rate of the steam, the velocity at this exit here, the total and flow energy of the steam, and then the rate that the steam is leaving. All right. So, oh, golly. There are a few assumptions that need to be made in this problem to work it the way that we want to work it. So, I'm going to um, state our assumptions right up front. We need to assume, assume steady flow. Um, of steam. So steam flow is steady. The steam is flowing at a steady rate. We have steam that's in a steady flow. So steady flow. Saturation conditions exist inside the, inside the cooker at all times, which makes sense because we're not creating superheated vapor. We're having this liquid that's boiling created steam. So we're going from a saturated liquid to a saturated vapor. We have some sort of mixture inside the pressure cooker. And we're um, just going to state up front that we have saturation conditions. Saturation conditions exist in cooker at all times. So we're saying that um, this steam is always going to be a saturated vapor. So what we're referring to as steam, we're going to be treating as a saturated vapor for the whole problem. Saturated water vapor. All right, so those are the main assumptions we're making. Now we wanna to try to start to figure out how we can get our mass flow rate of the steam and the velocity at our exit. So right off the bat, I'm going to think about what um, I can pull from the tables. So I know that I have a saturated vapor. 
Um, I know the pressure and I can go to my tables and look for things that are relevant. So one thing that jumps out to me is velocity and mass. So both of these are going to be um, related to specific volume. And, you know, while I'm there, I might as well also look up internal energy and enthalpy because I know that those are playing into my energy equations. So I'm gonna go to my uh, table A5, which is where we have pressure in the first column for uh, saturated liquid vapor of water. So table A5, and I'm going to go to uh, 150 kilopascal. And my specific volume of my saturated liquid is 0 0.001053 cubic meter per kilogram. Let me double check that I wrote that down right. And then my saturated vapor specific volume is 1.1594 cubic meter per kilogram. My internal energy of my saturated vapor, my U sub G is Two thousand five hundred and nineteen point two kilojoules per kilogram, and my specific enthalpy of my saturated vapor at one hundred and fifty kilopascals is going to be two thousand six hundred and ninety three point one kilojoules per kilogram. Let me know if you guys are getting different values. The lines are kind of hard to read when I'm trying to write and do other stuff, but I think those are right. That's from table A5, which is my saturated water pressure table for my saturated liquid vapor region. All right. So I have my, from table A5, let me just rewrite them here really quickly. Table A5, I have my specific volume of my saturated liquid. So the liquid in the pot, which is 0 0.001053 cubic meter per kilogram. I have my saturated specific volume of my vapor, which is 1.1594 cubic meter per kilogram. I have my specific internal energy and my specific enthalpy of my saturated vapor or my steam, 2,519.2 kilojoules per kilogram. And I have uh, 2,693.1 kilojoules per kilogram as my specific enthalpy. All right, so for A, for part A, I am trying to find the mass of the steam and the velocity that's occurring at the exit. So we have a few equations for mass. One of them is being density times cross-sectional area times velocity. But part of my, part of what this question is asking is for me to determine velocity at the exit. So that's not really gonna be the best one for me to choose because I'm missing a crucial thing to fill in. I can also, if I had energy, I could maybe try to in, uh, manipulate my energy equation. Um, one of the things that stands out to me in the question is I have a time component. So I know that I had a change in volume of liquid of six liters per 40 minutes. So I know um, my change in volume of my saturated liquid my liquid in the crock pot 
over a time. So I have a mass equation. My mass flow rate is my mass per time. So I know my per time here, or um, the, yeah, so my mass per time, my change in mass per my change in time. So the amount of mass that's leaving my system over the amount of time that it's leaving in. So I know that my change in time here is going to be 40 minutes. And my change in mass, I don't know exactly. I know my change in my change in volume of my saturated liquid is 0 0.6 liters, but I don't know my change in mass, but there's a relationship that exists where my change in mass is going to be my change in volume over my specific volume, right? Because volume is equal to mass times specific volume. That's like the definition. So these are kind of playing off each other. I have my change in volume. I have my specific volume. So therefore my change in mass here is just going to be my 0 0.6 liters of my volume that decreased of my saturated liquid divided by the specific volume of my saturated liquid, which is 0 0.001053 cubic meter per kilogram. All right. Did you not use density there to find your mass? If we know the so volume. So we know that. Um, we have a relationship between cubic meter and liter. Let me let me double check which way they convert it. All right. So they convert. Should be giving myself more room. All right, so we have our mass flow rate term, which we know is going to be 0 0.6 liters divided by 0 0.001053 cubic meter per kilogram per 40 minutes. So we know that we want our units to be kilograms per minute, kilograms per second, some sort of mass flow rate term. So we're gonna have liters cancel or mill, uh, cubic meters cancel. So we're gonna to need to convert either cubic meters to liters or liters to cubic meter. So the way that we can do that is multiplying this whole thing. One cubic meter is 1000 liters. So now our liters will cancel and our cubic meters will cancel. And we're left with just our kilograms per time. So when we multiply all of this out, We get two, what? Two point three seven times ten to the minus four kilograms per second. Um, I should have also included that I'm going to do. Sorry, so um, changing my notes a little bit. I, in my notes, I didn't include these conversions. I just did them in my calculator, which was not, not good of me. All right, so another conversion I'm gonna do is in one minute, there are 60 seconds. So that gives me my final answer in uh, kilograms. These minutes will cancel, so kilograms per second. So that's where you get the 2.37 times 10 to the minus four kilograms per second as our mass flow rate of steam that is leaving our crock pot. 
And now we know a clear relationship between mass and the velocity at the exit because um, while mass flow rate can be this change in mass over the change in time, it can also be equal to our density times our average velocity times our cross-sectional area. And we know the density because this is water and we know the cross-sectional area because it's given in the problem statement. We just figured out this mass flow rate. So now we can solve for this velocity term. So if we rearrange to have the velocity as our unknown, we have velocity is equal to mass flow rate divided by density times cross-sectional area. So the book works this problem a little bit differently where we don't just fill in density for water here. We're saying that this is going to be our So since this density term is down here in the bottom, we have um, one over density. And we know that um, we know that density is a heart. So density is one over mass over volume. So if we did, if we were to do one over density, then we would be inverting this. So the equation, The equation makes this into changing this density term into our specific volume of our saturated liquid vapor. So it, this equation becomes your mass flow rate times your, the specific volume of your saturated vapor divided by the cross-sectional area. The density of water changes a little bit with temperature, um, especially for steam. That's kind of why they say don't just use the density of water. I guess I understand that, but um, I think that this is kind of a complicated step to do here. So I don't think I would ask you to do that on an exam. But essentially one over density is saying that you have this inverted relationship of volume over mass. A volume per mass unit is a specific volume. So that they just converted one over density into specific volume, which I mean, makes sense, right? One over density is specific volume. That's not a huge leap. It's just kind of, I don't know, maybe not super intuitive at first. All right, so um, we do have everything to solve this uh, anyway. So we have our uh, specific, or our velocity at the exit of the steam is going to be our mass flow rate, which is 2.37 times 10 to the minus fourth. Oh, yeah. um, I had a piece of equipment just get delivered. I'm excited. Okay. So um, we have our, our mass flow rate of 2.37 times 10 to the minus four kilojoules per second. We have our specific volume of our steam, which is 1.1594 cubic meter per kilogram. We have our cross-sectional area, which was given to us as eight millimeters squared, or uh, another way of looking at eight millimeters squared is going to be eight times 10 to the negative six meters squared. So eight times 10 to the minus six meters squared. Solving for this, the velocity on average of our steam coming out of the exit is 34.3 meters per second. The kilograms will cancel. 
and um, all but one of these meters will cancel. So meters per second, our velocity in meters per second, those units make sense. It's moving at a very quick rate, right? 33, 30, 34.3 meters per second. So if you've ever cooked with a pressure cooker, you'll see that steam is like, you know, that's high pressure steam that's coming out of there of a very, very small opening, eight millimeters. And it is coming out really fast. It, you can really burn yourself badly if you put your hand over where that steam is exiting. Um, it actually kind of scares me. There was like some pressure cookers that blew up in the eighties that I still just like remember about because they are under such high pressure, but they cook food a lot faster. It cooks like, it'll cook a whole soup in like four minutes. It's awesome. We have one from Turkey at my house that we use all the time. It's great. Um, okay, so that's part A. All right, so part A was asking for the mass flow rate and the velocity that's occurring at the exit. Part B is asking for energy um, of the, <clears throat> the total flow energy of steam per unit mass. So our flow energy per steam per unit mass. Golly, I should have just made a new one. Oh, well, I wanted to keep this table stuff, but. All right, so for part B, we're looking at energy. That should immediately give you a hint that it's gonna be this energy equation. So we're asked for the energy, uh, the total and flow energy of steam per unit mass. So we have our total energy. Um, this is going to be the total energy of the exiting steam per unit mass. And we're gonna also, um, it's also asking, so this is for B, it's asking for this total energy, it's also asking for this specific like flow energy, but um, they're related to each other. So it probably could have just asked for total energy. All right, so we know that this specific energy here also denoted as this theta in the book um, is going to be our, pressure times specific volume plus internal energy plus specific kinetic energy plus potential energy. Or we could, if we wanted to put this into enthalpy, so enthalpy plus specific kinetic energy plus specific potential energy. Um, for this crack pot, we, it's not, um, there's no gravity component, there's no height component, there's no potential energy, the considerations. There's no change in velocity of the pot. Um, the steam might be changing velocity, but the pot itself, the whole system, the control volume is not changing velocity. So really our energy flow equation is just going to be equal to our enthalpy. So our energy, um, our specific energy of our fluid flow is going to be equal to our enthalpy, which we know to be, 2,693.1 kilojoules per kilogram. So this is per unit mass. This is our fluid flow energy of our specific energy per unit mass. If we want to look at our um, overall total mass, uh, total energy, rate of energy change per unit mass, or I'm sorry, if we want to look at our total energy change as a, as a result of this mass movement. So the moving of the mass from the crock pot into the steam in the air, we're gonna use our equation where our energy um, over time is equal to our mass flow rate times this fluid flow energy. We know mass flow rate from part one, which is 2.37 or part A times 10 to the negative four kilojoules per second. So from A. And then, how, yeah. How come it says that the, I don't know what you call it, the little e equals zero, but it also like equals a number? Or is that um, so this is not zero, this is theta. 
Oh my god. So if you look in the book, the book is, is that phi instead of theta? Um say that again. Is that phi instead of theta? Um well the second one I just drew was phi, but it's not phi, it's theta. That's why I'm always trying to say theta. So yeah, this is phi. That's not what the book writes. The book writes this. Unfortunately, I crossed through my zeros to make it clear there's zeros and not O's. So these get confusing. So whenever I write this, I always write E or this theta and I say it as I write it. Um, so yeah, sorry, it's confusing. But if you look in the book, they exclusively use the Greek letter. So I want you to be able to you know, work off your book and not be confused. So I'm trying to use both of the types of nomenclature. But this is not a zero. This is definitely this um, fluid flow energy term. I'll try to maybe not cross it through as much so it doesn't look like my zeros. I've also been working because I sometimes write my M's like really loopy, which can sometimes look like a mu. So yeah, it's just difficulties of having too many letters and using Greek letters and Latin letters and yeah. Okay. So we have our um, mass flow rate term. We have our specific energy term. We can plug this in and solve. So 2,693.1 kilojoules per kilogram is our specific energy term. And when we work this out, we're going to have kilograms cancel. We're going to have kilojoules per second, which is going to give us kilowatts. So this is going to be 0 0.638 kilojoules per second or 0 0.638 kilowatts. And this is going to be um, this is the total energy of the exiting steam. Total energy of exiting steam. And this is like per, per mass movement. So it's not specific energy, right? Like um, kilojoules per kilogram. This is saying that this is our total um, exiting energy of the steam when that mass is moving. So mass becomes a lot bigger deal here and the terminology kind of starts to overlap some more. All right. So page 225 to 228 in the book, I think do a nice job of kind of going through the different equations that we are looking at um, and kind of manipulating for this chapter. So I think that's helpful. Uh, as a note, this is that was for the eighth edition, page 219 to 225 in the ninth edition, I think are helpful. These sections are titled for other people in other books flow work and the energy of flowing fluid. So look for the section with that title, flow work and the energy of flowing fluid. Flow work and the energy of flowing fluid. It sounds like a really boring like book, but alas. All right.
So in the book, it starts to review um, how to look at energy analysis more. So energy analysis of steady flow systems, of steady flow systems. It's important here that we're looking at steady flow. So energy analysis of steady flow systems. If you remember when we were looking at energy analysis of steady flow systems, for steady flow, uh, we have the summation of our incoming mass flow rate must equal the summation of our outgoing mass flow rate. And if you have a single stream, if you have a steady flow rate single stream, then this is where you have your mass flow rate of 0.1 must equal your mass flow rate of 0.2. And if we were to look at the energy analysis of a steady flow system, not just the mass flow rate. Um, oh, did we, what was part C? Oh, the rate the steam leaves a pressure cooker. Um, So um, yeah, part C is asking for the rate that the energy of the steam is leaving the pressure cooker, which is that total energy. Um, it's kind of phrased weird because the rate that the steam is leaving is just the velocity at the exit. So the rate of energy is that kilowatts per second, or I'm sorry, kilojoules per second, that total energy term. So that's part C. So part B was the flow energy, part C is that total energy. I should have labeled it as part C. Let's see if I can go back. Part C. So it's saying like the, the rate at which energy leaves the cooker by steam, the rate steam leaves the pressure cooker and the energy. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> So um, if we're starting to look at energy analysis of these steady flow systems, here's where we have our same old energy equation. The change in energy of a system, general system, is going to be equal to energy coming in minus energy going out. For these problems, we're going to be looking at energy analysis. So um, energy coming in per time, over energy going out per time. The change in energy of a system is going to be the energy coming in per time minus the energy um, of the problem going out per time. The energy of the system is not changing because we are at a, um, this is a zero, we're at steady flow, steady state, steady flow. So we have no change in energy of the system, we're at steady which means that this becomes the energy over time coming in must equal the energy over time going out. If you remember from what we were doing before, this side is where we had um, our um, 
Well, I, I'm not going to say that. It's going to confuse you more. All right. So we have our energy per time coming in is equal to our energy per time coming out. So this is going to be our rate of net energy transfer by heat, work, and mass. So uh, this is going to include heat, work, and mass in. And this is our heat work mass considerations going out. And these are going to be rate of net energy transfer by heat work and mass. So rate of net energy transfer by heat work and mass coming in has to equal the rate of net energy transfer of heat work and mass going out. So then this becomes our heat coming in at a certain rate, plus our work coming in at a certain rate, plus the summation of our energy coming in, our mass flow rate times our uh, flow energy coming in has to equal our energy rate that our heat energy rate that's going out plus our work energy rate that's going out, plus the summation of our outgoing mass flow rate times our specific fluid energy. <clears throat> so when I'm talking about the summation of all of these coming in, this is um, going to be for each inlet, for each inlet. And this is going to be for each exit. So remember work per unit time is power. So this is actually a power term here. And our heat uh, rate of heat transfer per time. Um, whenever we see them um, as written as Q like this, we're assuming that we're transferring our heat between the control volume and the surroundings. I'm sorry, what did you say the answer was for C for that last one? Um, so, So the nomenclature, the, 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 we did, we did see, okay. So M, we looked at the mass of the steam leaving the velocity of the exit. B, we looked at flow energy. So this here, this flow energy. And C, we looked at this total energy. So the energy rate that the steam leaves. So this was part C. This is the answer to C. So our total mass energy rate that was leaving based on the mass of steam leaving the system was C. So the answer to part B was the meters a second or, or what? No, the answer to part B is this energy term here. This, this equation here is B. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right. So we have our heat and work plus our fluid energy mass movement. Um, our, our heat work and mass term for coming in, heat work and mass term for going out. Sometimes in the examples we're looking at, we have multiple inlets. So we have multiple streams that are coming in. Um, and we'll have, even if we have one stream coming in, we might have multiple streams leaving. So we have, you know, water flowing into a system and half of it goes north and half of it goes south. So you can have multiple exits or you can have multiple inlets. The, um, book kind of does a better job at explaining all of these different equations over time and how we kind of manipulate these. So I really highly encourage you to read through the book and um, kind of
kind of look at what the book is saying, uh, how we're doing these uh, analyses. But keep in mind, this is the equation for our steady flow systems. So uh, one of the last things I'm going to talk about here is when we're looking at our systems, we have something like a, a, a diffuser or a nozzle or a turbine or a mixing chamber or a heat exchanger, things that we're going to go over more on Wednesday, all of these different types of steady flow systems or open, um, open systems. But in general, I'm just going to model this first one as a box. So we have some sort of box that we're doing our, our analyses around. So this box could be um, representing a diffuser or a nozzle or a turbine or something. I'm just representing it as a general box. We have some sort of mass that is flowing into the box, maybe through some little portal here. So we have um, mass in and we have mass that's coming out if we only have a single stream coming in and a single stream coming out. So this is going to be mass out. I should keep the same nomenclature. Mass out. And within this box, this is what I'm defining as my control volume, this box itself. So I'm not defining the pipes. I'm not defining um, you know, anywhere in the inlets or exits. I'm defining the box itself, where the mixing, where the heat exchange, where the um, reactions are happening. This is what I'm defining as my control volume. Control volume. So we call this CV. Um, often we have mass that's coming in and mass that's leaving. We have a volumetric flow rate. We have um, exchange that's happening. So this is different than our first four chapters where this would be a closed system. Now we're open. We don't have this, oh, well, this is my system. This is what's defined. We have to figure out what we are doing our analyses around, what these equations are going to be based on and define our control volume. So once we have this control volume defined, we can define this incoming mass as stream one or our incoming point one, right where this is incoming and right where it's exiting, this is point two. If we have multiple streams, which we'll look at later, it gets a little more complicated, but the, the important part is to be defining our um, control volume first. If we were to add a, an additional mass out here. So this would be our second exit. We could define this as 0.3. So this single stream here only applies where there is one inlet and one outlet, one entrance, one exit. You can't use single stream, the single stream equation if you have anything more than one incoming and one outgoing. All right. All right, um, I don't, we only have 15 minutes left and I don't really want to just start a whole new section because they all kind of build on each other. All right, so I'm just gonna end class a little bit early because I don't want to start a whole new section introducing nozzles, turbines, diffusers, 
um, throttling valves, mixing chambers, heat exchangers, pipe and duct flow, all in the next 15 minutes. So we'll just pick that up on Wednesday. Um, we are going to continue in chapter five on Wednesday. Please start reading at least through page 228 in the eighth edition and 225 in the ninth edition. And I will see you all on Wednesday. You have homework due on Friday. Um, you should have most what you need for the homework that's due on Friday. Um, I'm gonna make a little bit of an edit to, I believe it's question two because um, we haven't done very much with electrical power. So I'm gonna be giving you some additional hints and equations for that one. And then for the rest of it, a lot of it's just equation manipulation for these different uh, mass equations. Um, you, hmm. I'm gonna push this homework back. I'm gonna make it due next Friday because I think it'll be more helpful once you have the information from Wednesday and then the um, the practice problem solving on Friday. So I'm gonna go ahead and change this homework five to be due on next Friday, which I don't think messes up anything. Um, yeah, you're welcome, Kat. Okay, so it was originally due March 19th. I'm gonna make it due, that would make it March 25th, right? So uh, March 26th, oh, say, okay, so it'll be due at 1135 AM. So five minutes into class on next Friday, March 26th. And then the notes from Wednesday and then the practice problem from Friday will be helpful for you for finishing that. I'm still gonna add a little tweak to the question about electrical work, um, but that won't really be a big deal. And then um, I'll be posting this recording Please do the readings. Are there any questions before I conclude? All right, well, have a good rest of your day. I know we all probably need a nap because daylight savings time is so hard springing ahead. It was like really hard to wake up this morning, um, even for beefy. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm hopefully going to have the test graded by Friday. I'll have your grades posted by then and I'll try to bring them in class on Friday. So I'll try to do most of them by Wednesday and have the grades posted by Thursday or Friday. All right, well then have a great rest of your day. Good luck with the week. There's only like five more weeks of classes left after this one. So see you on Wednesday. Bye.